The following program is brought to you by Fanbags Cornhole, Chicago's official supplier of professional cornhole boards and bags. Choose from any of their officially licensed designs or have my boy Brian design a custom set using anything from a selfie to your company's logo. Visit www.fanbagscornhole.com and use the promo code BRAGS to get 10% off your entire order. That's www.fanbagscornhole.com and use the promo code BRAGS for 10% off. Step up your game with Fanbags Cornhole. It's Zach Eady with Purdue Men's Basketball, and you're watching Boilers in the Stands. Welcome back to Boilers in the Stands post game show. I'm your host, Greg Braggs Jr. Alongside me, as always, is Joe Jackson and Craig Bowers. After a very entertaining Boilers win in Ann Arbor, where Purdue fans showed out and and were very loud all game long, it was a lot of fun to hear them uh, get go go crazy after every big play, especially in the first half, and then. The second half really had a dis- uh, a pretty impressive display of shot making from both teams, uh, but there's no question the story of today's game is Zach Eady, 35 points, a career high, completely dominant. We'll get into a lot of the details on how he was able to get to 35 points on the day, but just showing a lot of patience in getting his buckets, buckets just being very efficient and taking it to the fight every game. It seems like, you know, every team's going to want to get physical right out the gate with Purdue and, you know, Purdue wins the war of attrition yet again, as Michigan gets into a lot of foul trouble. Uh, Like I said, a lot of stuff to cover, really excited to see how talk about how Purdue attacked Michigan's defense and the difference makers all across the board for this team from Braden Smith, Zach Eady, Lance Jones, Mason Gillis, you know, Fletcher lawyers trying to, you know, get over the hump of a little bit of a struggle here. These last few games, he even had a few buckets go down. So a lot to get into here today. Um, Craig, I'll start with you, your, your instant reactions here to today's game. Well, I mean, Purdue just dominated in the paint all the way around, whether it's from a scoring aspect or a rebounding aspect, I think, you know, we'll, we'll get into the team stats later on, but 24 second chance points on, I think 17 offensive rebounds, uh, just absolutely killed Michigan in the glass. And then early on, Reed did a fairly nice job of trying to push Edie up the lane a little bit, but Edie just wore everybody down. And there was a stretch in there where he caught the ball in the post, what felt like right in front of the basket about four times in a row. And just they they weren't putting up any resistance whatsoever to where Zach was getting in the post. And if you let him get that deep, it, it's done. Like there's nothing you can do against him at that point. So just a dominant, dominant game from Zach. Um, and your big three showed up, right? <clears throat> um, there's some other guys tonight that maybe didn't shoot the ball great, but anytime Lance and Smith and Edie all three show up on the same night, it's going to be really hard for anybody to beat them. Yeah, there's no question. We have a couple people in the chat, and and I agree with this. Um, and forgive me for going off of the CBS uh, um, crew announcing a career high. It was a season high for Zach Eady, but not a career high. He 
He Zach Eady had a career high last year as he dominated uh, Michigan State, and uh, that that was 38 yesterday last year. He fell just short of uh, 40 last year at home at Mackey Arena. And Purdue's next game is next Saturday evening at Mackey Arena for the chance to uh, have a a share of the Big Ten regular season championship. So shout out to those in the chat that are staying on top of the ball when it comes to the correct stats. So I apologize for that out the gate. But a season high for Zach Eady with 35 points. Certainly uh, was pushing for 40. He just did, like you said, just such a phenomenal job. Uh, everybody in the post, uh, and we'll get into a lot of how they were able to to feed the post, and that's why we're going to kick it to Joe for his instant reaction of feed the post fame. Yeah, I mean, obviously this has to start with what Zach Eady did, 35 points, 15 rebounds. Michigan had, the only answer they sort of had was Terrace Reed, and he, like we said, got into foul trouble. Um, Eady got a couple other bigs into foul trouble, and Michigan, for the most part, stayed pretty much one-on-one coverage, which is um, that's kind of what, you know, when we talk about that 38 career high against Michigan state, Tom Izzo stayed one-on-one coverage the entire game against Edie and Edie just did whatever he wanted, had his way again today. And it's, you know, this, this is a good thing because, um, from everybody else, it wasn't, you know, a great game. I would say, uh, there's, there was some solid play from people, but it was a game where it felt like Purdue just, whether it's good or not, they just coasted that entire second half. It was never a point where I was like actually worried Michigan would win, uh, but Purdue was also never able to actually put them away. Maybe some concern there that they weren't able to put them away, but also I understand they're just probably just trying to get a win, get out of there, get to their rest week. Um, but yeah, Edie, Edie's him. Edie's the best player in the country, most dominant player in the country. And and when you have him on your team and he can do what he does, you're gonna you're gonna get a lot of wins that way. Yeah, there's no question about. It. Um, you know, Zach Eady is just, you know, it's just something that you have to appreciate while you still have it. I mean, they, they put the graphic on the screen during the game of, of his opportunity to win back to back national player of the year awards. And it seems like he'll be the front runner for that yet again. Um, you know, and, and I just think the last two games, I think the thing to appreciate these last couple games is the patience he's showing, you know, um, you know, that's always going to be a battle guys just trying to rip them down and, and, and try to, you know, out physical. And that's, and that's like out the gates again today, Michigan sprung out to an early lead because they were really playing a physical brand of basketball, which is like basically every team's, you know, strategy against Purdue. Let's see how many times we can follow them. Let's see how much the refs are going to call. And whether they call them early or not, eventually, yeah, they got to start calling them for the amount you have to foul Purdue just to try to stay in the game. Well, that works both ways. You can muddy the waters and stay in it, but then eventually, you know, the the fouls start adding up. And even if Michigan was able to climb their way back in it, they they had three guys that had fall, fouled out at that point. And you know how you're able to survive late in the game or even in an overtime is is a tall task. So, you know, the second half was cleaner from that standpoint, um, you know, as opposed to like the first six minutes of the game. And it was, you know, like somebody said in the chat and I highlighted it because, you know, I had a feeling some people would, would mention this, but JB says in the chat, great for Michigan. What was our grade? C minus. And, and I would disagree with this. Like, yes, Michigan is the worst team from a win loss perspective in the big 10, but the way they played in the second half, Any team in the Big Ten would take that. They were doing a great job of shot making. You know, it was back and forth, and Purdue just did a good job. I mean, we've talked about it with how Purdue, you know, had to get in the game against Ohio State when they were down. They had to get stops. Michigan could not get stops. Purdue just kept matching anything Michigan would do. Really good guard play uh, from McDaniel. And then from Braden Smith, just kind of going back and forth in that chess match. And then every time it felt like Lance Jones would provide a dagger three or a dagger layup, they just, Purdue's just got so much in their arsenal right now. Yeah. And I mean, Michigan stayed with everybody at home. Like it's not like people have gone up for the most part to Michigan and just blown them out. They've got some guys on that team. Doug McDaniel is a dude. Um, he's not playing road games. So that team looks completely different from, from home in a way, obviously. And 
they did a really nice job of knocking down some mid-range shots too, right? And everybody knows that's what Purdue's going to give up, and it's just a matter of whether you can hit them or not. And they hit some shots. Um, so, I mean, it is what it is. Like, Purdue was comfortable that entire second half at just kind of keeping them at arm's length. Um, they had enough offensive production. It might not have been the most efficient night offensively, but if you're going to get that many second-chance opportunities, um, again, you put up mid-80s, you should be able to win every college basketball game that you play in. Yeah, and also Trey Jackson knocks down two threes. He hasn't been a shooter this year. Uh, Jace Howard knocks down a three and I believe two other jumpers. So there's still, a lot of, I think there's still a lot of things that need to be improved defensively from Purdue, but sometimes this stuff's going to happen. And when we look back to last year, like how confident are we that last year's team would have been able to keep Michigan? What Michigan got to like five or seven points in the second half and that was it. Um, like this year's team can do that. This year's team can withstand the the outlier shooting performances from other teams and also not having everybody on and still win and not even just win, but also, um, yes, they didn't dominate, but we're able, they were in control that pretty much that entire game. Like even if they weren't and, putting them away, it was still Purdue's game to lose. Right. And, and also like, remember when we talk about an off shooting night this year, we're talking mid 20%, right? I think they finished 29.2% today. Yeah. Off shooting nights from three last year were in the teens. There was, yep. there were five or six different games last year where Purdue shot between like 12 to 18% from three. Um, so the floor of where that sh quote bad game shooting from three is just completely different this year compared to last year. True. And I, and I think the other big difference maker in this game was the offensive rebounds. We'll get into it in team stats, obviously, but at the same time, I, I think that was one of the big stories of this game. You know, Michigan might have been able to climb in this and make it a more uh, closer uh, competitive game had they got to some rebounds, but Purdue continued to beat them to loose balls, beat them on the 50-50 balls underneath the rim, and there was just a few times where, especially in the first half, where Mason Gillis, at one point, Braden Smith takes a heat check type three, and Michigan comes right back down and gets a layup and cuts it to six. I think it was 40 to 34. Purdue comes back down. Mason Gillis chases down a missed three, and Michigan's just standing there watching. They're not going after the ball. Well, Mason just kind of went around two guys and, and, and chased the ball down. Kicks it to Braden Smith. Braden Smith misses a three, and he chases down his own miss and gets the rebound, makes a nice uh, feed to uh, kick it back out to Lance Jones. Bang, dagger three. Now it's 43-34, and that was a moment there of you know momentum that was stymied for Michigan because they didn't want to go after the, the, the rebound, and then that's when Purdue's crowd just erupted and all of a sudden, Purdue really started to separate themselves and take control of this basketball game. And that was like kind of a chills moment. I see a lot of people talking about it in the chat, the whose house, our house chant at the end. I mean, it, you, that was, I mean, Purdue fans travel well, but man, today it really stood out and it, it got me thinking ahead. I mean, we always are constantly thinking about March, but when you think about the opportunity that Purdue has, to play in Indianapolis. You've got three games left and a two game lead in the big 10. You have a chance to play your first two games of the March madness tournament in Indianapolis, which we all saw, you know, obviously it's going to be a home game, but we all saw with the Arizona Purdue game, what that crowd looked like early this season. And now if you go to Detroit, which would be the second round for Purdue, if they keep this road, now you're going to Michigan where look at how they showed out for a road game today. Now you're going to go to a neutral site and that's an opportunity for Purdue fans to really show up in the way that they did when they took on uh, Tennessee and, um, and, and, and Virginia down in um, that was in Tennessee. Right. I mean, so that was an op that, that was one of the greatest, you know, home crowd environment type March madness atmospheres Purdue's ever in Kentucky. Given. Kentucky. That's right. I apologize. Yeah. So, um, but still like, you know, Purdue fans, you know, travel well. And so it was just, a, I just, that was just one of the more fun things of the, of the entire day to see. Did you like it? You guys, I thought you, I thought you were on mute, Joe. I saw your mouth move. You, but were, I didn't you were, well, so you were flabbergasted by that. Yeah. I, I had, that was, 
I got nothing to add to that. That was a, uh, it's always cool to see. And, and like you said, uh, Purdue's path most likely goes through Detroit or Indy, then Detroit, if they are able to make it that far, it's a good sign that should be big crowds for however far Purdue's able to make it in this tournament. Yeah, absolutely. And, and ticket prices weren't crazy low down there uh, or up there. I should say my sister um, is married to a Michigan fan and they looked at going to that game and in lower level seats were, I mean, they weren't going for what they were going in Mackey, but they were 150, 160 bucks. So uh, tickets weren't necessarily cheap and Purdue fans were still buying and still showing up. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. So yeah, it was, it's, it, you know, it's exciting and you got Michigan state coming up in a week. So they get a lot of time off here you know, the entire week, uh, Monday through Friday to, you know, come back home and, and, and rest up a little bit and get ready for a big, uh, big matchup at home against the Michigan state Spartans for a chance at a share, potentially a share of a big 10 title. But at the same time, um, Illinois, who's the last team left that has a chance to catch Purdue for the big 10, they play two games before Purdue plays their next game. They have Minnesota at home. And then they play Wisconsin on the road on Saturday at noon before Purdue plays. So there is a chance that, you know, Purdue could have the, you know, the entire thing locked up, you know, uh, in a few different ways. So we'll just have to monitor how Illinois does. They, they snuck out of a game the other day or the other night or last night, I believe I'm kind of losing my days here. So uh, it's going to be exciting here with three regular season games left to go. And that break between now and Sunday or Saturday, whenever we play again, um, is is to me is is going to be really really important for this team. Um, I thought they've looked fresh the last two two games they've played. I thought there were some they looked a little tired before that, but I still think that that is going to be big for them. Guys, uh, I, I want to talk to you real quick. I'm <clears throat> really excited to talk about one of our new advertising partners. Autograph is a new app co-founded by Tom Brady with one specific mission. Autograph Fandom Reward app allows devoted fans to unlock the most memorable experiences and rewards. One thing I love about this app is that you can get all the best ba college basketball content in one place, such as your favorite blogs and podcasts. It's all right there in one centralized location for you, cater to your favorite teams. Now, here's the true beauty of this app. You can earn rewards by just consuming content that you're already consuming, reading, or listening to right there by accessing it through the Autograph app itself. Once you've signed up, you'll start earning points and achievement trophies, and you can check team leaderboards to see how you stack up against other Purdue fans. As you level up in status, you'll unlock unique rewards curated by specifically for you based on your favorite team. Download the Autograph app now and use the referral code BITS and start unlocking rewards today. And Joe, I know you really thought some of the other... Um, rewards that they have listed on there and opportunities were cool. Yeah, it is pretty cool that they're kind of diving into individual college spaces. And so some of the things that they're doing for, you know, rewarding people for being on their app for uh, interacting with different articles, podcasts, and just the community in general um, is they're giving away like tickets. So they have two uh, ticket packages for the upcoming Purdue MSU game. That is $32 total, $16 a piece. Um, and then they have three ticket packages for the season finale Purdue against Wisconsin home game. That is senior night. So uh, there's stuff like that. There's also a bunch of sweepstakes that they do for tickets, including um, they're going to have like a VIP package for the round of eight uh, game in March Madness, where eight people are going to be able to get the VIP experience, go to LA, um, you know, travel and all that's included go to the game, um, sweet level, all that stuff. Just just some really cool stuff that they're doing. Um, and a lot of what they want you to do is just go on the app and interact. Our stuff, you know, our podcast will be on there. Um, it, some articles, just everything that you see from, from your normal Purdue cons content consumption, it's all going to be there. You just go on um, and then you're going to be able to refer others. And we have a referral code BITS, B-I-T-S, when you go in uh, to be able to use the app. And yeah, it, it's just a cool way to be able to kind of almost just reward you for being a fan. Um, you're already consuming this type of content anyway. So uh, now you have a chance to get tickets and, and things like that going forward. So really cool um, app. I, you know, I'm, I'm happy to uh, be partnered with them. Yeah. hundred uh, percent. Yeah. I was going to say, uh, sorry, yeah. Lori in the chat saying autograph right now is for Apple products only, but in a week or so it's going to be launched for Android as well. So stay tuned for that. If you're an Android user, like I am, but it is available for Apple products. So like I said, you know, you have the QR code, which we've shared. I'm going to put it on the big screen. Use that QR code. Like 
uh, Joe and Craig were saying, make sure you use the promo code bits. Uh, Chris Kramer is also partnered up with them. So we're in a bit of a competition with Chris Kramer and we cannot let Chris win. So you got to have our backs here. Use the promo code bits. Uh, so they'll know you, you, you heard them from, uh, heard about them from us. And, and yeah, you, then you have an opportunity to go to some of these last few home games and anybody that's a Purdue fan knows just how hard it is to come by tickets at Mackey arena. Purdue fans don't sell their tickets. Uh, so this is, what's pretty cool is that, you know, autograph is going to always reward the fans. They sent fans, uh, Michigan fans to the national championship for football here earlier this season. Uh, so they want to send you guys to the last couple home games. They're going to have more offers coming down the road, like we said, in the March Madness tournament as well. So uh, they're a new partner here to this show. And we're excited to talk about them here today. Yeah. And there's no cost to sign up, right? The app's free. So you just get to go on and get rewarded for being a fan, doing what you're already doing. Yep. So uh, the QR code will be here at the bottom as we uh, move into the next segment of our show. So, uh, you know, make sure you sign up for that. And uh, we appreciate Autograph jumping on board with us for the end of this season. Uh, so let's get into it. Like I said, team stats. This will be our team stats segment, um, you know, like we always do and and talk about it. SLK Boiler just signed up. Let's go, SLK. We appreciate you. Like always showing love. Uh, Blake Widmer, fine. I'll sign up just to support bits. So yes, use that promo code bits all day long. We appreciate you guys. You know how much we love when you guys show the love here. Uh, so yeah, a uh, lot, lot to get into as far as team stats on the game. Um, you know, like I said, red hot shooting 48% for Michigan, 47 for Purdue, um, 43% from three for Michigan and only 29% for Purdue seven of 24. But as I said before, the rebounds is the story there because a lot of their offensive rebounds came off of missed threes or, you know, a rebound off a shot turned into one of their, you know, seven made threes that were certainly dagger shots. They had 17 Purdue had 17 offensive rebounds on the day, uh, win the total rebound battle 41 to 28 turnovers. Always, always something that we pay attention to only eight turnovers on the game for Purdue. Uh, and then points in the paint, as Craig mentioned, Purdue just absolutely dominated in the paint. And I'm excited for Joe to really emphasize why when we get into X's and O's with Joe in our next segment, but 44 points in the paint for Purdue. And a lot of that obviously has to do with Zach Eady's dominance, but also what Braden Smith does to, you know, really open things up and how they move. Purdue just does such a good job of moving the ball and showing patience, getting the ball inside 18 assists for Purdue on 32 made baskets. So just a really nice job by Purdue all the way across the board today, gentlemen. Yeah. And I, there's a lot of different things that jump out there. I'm going to go to one uh, that maybe doesn't stand out quite as much, but Purdue got seven steals today. Uh, Purdue's not a team that's necessarily going to turn you over a bunch, but if they can get a little bit of ball pressure, force a few turnovers just to create some easy baskets, especially on a day like today where, um, they didn't shoot great from outside. They didn't shoot terrible, but they didn't shoot great from outside. And being able to get some of those easy points helps. So they they end up with 10 points off of those seven steals that they create um, on Michigan. So I like seeing Lance get out and push the ball a little bit. Every time Braden had a chance off of a missed shot or off of a turnover, he was turning and burning. Um, we, we looked quicker again today compared to what we have in some of the last few games. And I thought we looked quicker when we were – playing really good earlier this season. I, and I thought that was nice to see. Yeah. And I, I agree with that. I think Purdue controlled a lot of this tempo. There was a lot of, there was just a few plays where Michigan was just, it was just kind of like almost giving the ball to Purdue. Also the one that's highlighted in my head is the Doug McDaniel lob pass. Um, Brain just takes it and goes. Uh, but when we look at the, the overall stats, rebounding is obviously huge. Purdue um, dominates that area. Also just not shooting well, but winning. It, it's kind of just, Hey, Purdue can win in multiple ways. Obviously, this one came from Edie. Um, turnovers also. Purdue had eight, only eight turnovers. There was a little point in the game where it felt like uh, things could start getting a little out of hand, and it felt like it was getting a little chaotic. But eight turnovers only, also a very good thing. Michigan ten points off of those turnovers, um, and so you know when Purdue when Purdue doesn't turn the ball over much and they rebound the ball as well as they do, like those are just always going to be two things that we highlight because they're super important to what this team does they are part of the identity 
their their offense is the best in the country. Um, and so when or one of the best, I, I don't know what they're actually ranked right now. But basically, when you get good shots like Purdue does, you get as many as you can. More often than not, they're going to fall, and that's just going to be good things for now. Yeah, and and how many turnovers? You know, it felt like a handful came with trying to feed it into Trey Kaufman Wren. Uh, and he, you could definitely see some frustration from Trey on the game. You know, at one point he finally got a foul call at the end and he kind of put his hands up like, you know, finally, this is what I've been working for this entire game. And they, they seem to have trouble at times getting it into him or him getting good position. So I don't know how much that played into it, but at the end of the day, they did keep it low. Obviously keeping it under 10 is always the goal. Uh, so yeah, I thought they did a nice job there. Overall, we did have a guy here in the chat that brought up a pretty good stat uh, since we're doing stats of the game. And Blaine J says through 28 games, this is the best record in the painter era, 25 and three besting the 2009, 2010 boilers at 24 and four. So that's a pretty good stat there. Yeah, no doubt. And obviously there's been some incredible teams in this painter era uh, whether you want to go back and look at, you know, Robbie and Etwan um, and Juwan on that team, or whether you want to take it to the Dakota Mathias, Vincent Edwards, Isaac Haas, PJ Thompson, Carson Edward years. Um, it's, it's truly a testament for this team to say that they've gotten out to the best record through the the 28 games without a doubt. Something and, Jer I be proud of. and Jeremy Hunter says in the ch chat, he said, I counted three on the uh, Trey Kaufman Wren uh, entry passes that that might have been a turnover. We can go into individual stats at some point and, and find that out for yeah. sure. But just just overall, like there's just times where you know because you know they're trying to get it into him, and and so there was one time where Lance really delivered a nice pass that he didn't hesitate. And Purdue is just so methodical and deliberate with making sure they're going to get it in cleanly. There's just times where I wish the pass would come in a little faster. And there's just a little bit of hesitancy at times. And Trey and Zach, Zach obviously just does an unbelievable job of, you know, you know, really, you know, making space and, and a, a good passing angle, you know, guys aren't getting around him unless they're going to follow him. And sometimes there is a hesitancy to throw it in. And that, that little split second hesitance can, you know, be the difference in a turnover and a made bucket. So, you know, um, you know, picking nits a little bit because Purdue just does such a good job of, you know, taking advantage of that area, but we want perfection uh, as we uh, strive to, to the, to Arizona in a final four appearance. Yeah. 100%. It's to, to win in March, especially you, you have to be, you have to be a little bit lucky 100%, but you got to play nearly perfect for six straight games. It's a tough thing to do is uh we Purdue fans have, have figured that out the past few years. Uh, so you, you you got anything else, Craig, while we're still in the team stats uh, segment of the show? Uh, I was just going to say in regards to the TKR, a couple of those passes, like two of those passes just weren't good passes. One of them came from Cam, who's still kind of feeling out his way. He's not usually necessarily the post-entry passer. And, and it's a different thing throwing it to TKR than throwing it to Zach, just in terms of where they want the ball exactly and, you can rifle some absolute bullets and Smith and Jones both did to Edie today in terms of just firing him down there. Um, and he's got such soft hands, he's going to catch it. So I think there's a little bit of an adjustment, especially for guys like Cam that are in their first year, uh, still getting used to ha how to get that into TKR exactly. And then I think the other stat of the game, and they kept bringing it up on the telecast, but I think um, Zach Edie finished with uh, being fouled 10 times on the game. Uh, and, you know, obviously he does so does well at the free throw line. He certainly has over the last three games. He got a little bit of the announcers jinx at one point, but just overall, that's the other aspect. I think that's a big stat that, you know, when we, when we normally break down the, the team comparisons on stats of the game that gets left out is who's, you know, the one that's uh, getting the fouls and those add up, you know, and, and we saw that again with Michigan here today, it adds up not just for the end of the game, but the rotations throughout. And you had a guy, you know, in, with Michigan that, you know, was just coming off being sick. You know, it, he, you could tell he was physically exhausted in the first half alone. And he's doing everything he can to hold on for dear life. Ed Reed, who's had some nice games here, you know, he did nothing. He had, 
Terrence Ed, Reed? Did Terrence I say Reed. Ed Reed? I'm thinking football. You know? yeah. yeah, Ed Reed. You know, not Ed Reed. Ed Reed. If he took, if he, if he was beelining for somebody, he might take somebody out for sure. Yeah. Uh, but Terrence Reed was doing everything he could. He had two points on the game, you know, so he he really just didn't have any, you know, impact offensively. But you know, his job was just try to hold on for dear life with uh, with Zach Eady. Well, good luck to you. Thirty five more points for the reigning National Player of the Year and an opportunity for uh, another one here coming up. Yeah, this. National player of the year is locked up, right? Yeah. yeah. It's been locked up it's for done. a while. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it wasn't and, before it is now. Well, and 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 Craig cut the clip, you know, and put it on social media. If you follow us on Boilers and Stands on Twitter after the last game against Ohio State, you know, where Braden was asked about being on the Naismith finalist award. And we talked about it during the bo- post game show, not knowing this quote that, you know, I was curious to how much they were going to acknowledge the elephant in the room they have throughout the year about, you know, the failures of last year, writing wrongs. And, and, and Braden was like, I'm not worried about being a finalist for Naismith. And I don't think Zach Eady's worried about being back-to-back national player of the year. Cool. I'm sure it'll be cool. And something he looks back on and appreciates, but you know, when Zach Eady said it, I'm going to run it back, you know, and these guys know what, you know, they have to, you know, come back from after last year and everybody's not going to let them forget, you know, I, I I'm interested to see how they celebrate a big 10 championship this year. I'm interested to see how Zach Eady celebrates winning national player of the year. Again, something tells me there's a different mindset with this team when it comes to, you know, um, some of these achievements because they have unfinished business. And when Zach said, I'm running it back, I think that they all kind of understood. Okay. This guy is coming back for us. We need to do right by him. We need to do right by Matt Painter. And uh, so I'm excited to see these guys. You know, I like that they're embracing the failure. You know, that's that's the kind of attitude they need to have going into March. You know, a chip on their shoulder. You know, it's one thing when you're the best team in the country and you go in and you got to play Fairly Dickinson or St. Peter's or North Texas and you're this prohibitive favorite and the other team's got nothing to lose. And but this time around, I just feel like Purdue is walking in as the favorite on paper and the favorite when they come out the tunnel, but with an underdog mentality because of the way you know a lot they are viewed and treated by some you know in the media and and you know just some of the narrative around these guys and you know they haven't forgotten it. Fans and media don't let them forget it, and so I'm excited to see these guys you know, uh, have that chip on their shoulder when March starts. Hey, you know, I got news for everybody here. I already booked my flight to Arizona. I, I, I believe in this team I have for years and, you know, just because they, you know, you know, fell short a few times, they were devastating losses, but I still think this team is fully capable of doing what, you know, um, you know, we all hope they can. Yeah. I don't, yeah. I don't got much to add to that. Yes, sir. So that's a, just that's the mic drop moment for you, Greg. So yep. yeah, we're just hey, gonna let it stand. Book, book your flights to Arizona. That's what I'm trying to say. And uh shout out to Autograph one last time here as we move on to the next segment of our show. Make sure you use that QR code, sign up for uh using the promo code bits, and they'll know you heard it from us. And uh you might have a chance to win some tickets here. We'll you know, uh, we'll dial that back. We'll run that back here at the end of the show to explain how exactly you can win if you're showing up here a little late to the show, which is okay here on a Sunday afternoon. So let's move on to the next portion of our show. And it's just, it's a portion of the show that everybody loves and it's been well missed. People have been begging for it. And that is X's and O's with Joe. So Joe, what do you got for us here today? Because you know, uh, you know, I, I, I was talking to you at halftime about some things that certainly stood out to me, but I want to hear what stood out for you. Yeah, and we're we are going to talk about one of those things. Um, with my mic, just let me know if I'm too far away and you can't hear me. But going to start. So I center this. There we go. So just to pick and up, pick and roll against the hedge, right? Michigan, their entire game plan is going to be hedge, and so by hedging means this defender right here, right, who is going to be guarding Edie. When Brain Smith comes off of this screen, he's going to be stepping out here. And now 
what Michigan did specifically is sometimes hedges, the defender will be like this to try to force the ball handler to go this way. What they did is they had their defender kind of like this, where he's more flat, and they're just wanting Brain Smith to go this way. And so as that happens, right, screen happens, Brain Smith's going to roll off of this, Edie's going to dive, and I know this is uh, not the easiest to, to follow right there, but so Edie's diving down here, Mason Gillis, who is right here, he's coming up to the top. And so now you have Brain Smith here with the ball, and you remember, Edie's defender was in a hedge. So he's defenders here, defenders here. Usually what they've done, especially today, um, is they ran what's kind of called like an exit screen. And so lawyer would like pin in Jones here. All this is trying to do is just keep these two defenders occupied, right? They just want to basically keep them um, focused on, on Jones and lawyer or whoever is in this corner. So that way they can't help because now what this is doing, you can count one, two, three, four defenders. Now Brainsmith has... He's going to have Gillis, who's popping to the top of the key, or he's going to have Edie. It's going to be Gillis's defender's job either to tag Edie on this roll right here. And if he does, that means Gillis is going to get this wide open three. And if this defender is going to go up, that's when you see those lobs to Edie or you pass downs to Edie. Sometimes this defender will rotate late, and that's how you get some post-ups. But uh, just, you know, that was one of the things we've talked about this entire season is how does Brainsmith handle the hedge? And they've just they've gotten really, really good at it. One other thing we're going to go to, um, especially with just how dominant Edie was today. There's a lot of setup actions that Purdue runs to get Edie the ball. But in general, I'm going to go through just the most simplest one right here. And in general, it's those same key concepts, just maybe a couple more elaborate steps in the way. And so it's just going to be, you know, you have a ball. Uh, they'll do here. 55, zero. Edie's here. And so it's a box formation. Gillis, or whoever this is going to just run off opposite side here. This guy's going to go here. And then as this is happening, he's going to run off like this curl off of a little pin down screen right here from Edie. And as that's happening, the only thing that really matters is Edie's just trying to get position. Because once he sets the screen, he's turning and trying to seal his defender. Because as the ball, the ball's going to get swung to here. And so now, as we move to where everybody's at next... Guy's going to have the ball here. Edie's going to have position right here against his defender. Smith's going to be here. And then you have two guys on the weak side. Um, so now it's going to force Edie to have really good positioning. And so he's going to be able to go to work. If Michigan helps, then Edie makes the read off from there. And like I said, there's a lot of stuff that Purdue will go into before that um, to get Edie looks. But in general, that's always going to try to be the end result is you get a guy um, strong side for Edie getting the ball with everybody else cleared out on the opposite side. Sometimes our foreman, whether it be Gillis or TKR, will dig down to the rim when Edie gets the ball. But um, even though that was, like I said, that's the simplest version of it, but a lot of them revolve around that, especially when it's on more of the block and not in the middle. So David Dillman in the chat's asking, so now if Gillis doesn't have the three, he may have a good pass into Edie, right? Yes. Yeah. And that'll flow into what's called a high low action. And so that's just um, exactly what you just said right there is then Gillis will have the ball here. Edie's going to have the ball here. Generally, we'll have his defender somewhat sealed. And especially when Purdue is putting two guys on this side over here, that means Edie has this entire space to work with. And yeah, so this high low pass, he's going to get it up here, throw down there. That is definitely a thing. If you know a defender closes out well on Gillis, they'll go into that. Or if TKR is the one especially that's in, they'll almost automatically flow into that a high low look more rather than trying to have TKR pop for a three. And and really, I mean, and Craig, you can speak on this too. I, I think the added element from last year to this year is they are really going with Braden, you know, as they come off that pick and roll to start at the top. Two guys are traveling with Braden. Three guys are keeping their eye on Zach. So it, it just creates this trickle down effect where, I mean, they're leaving Mason Gillis open and they're going to get to a point where the, I mean, it's almost like they still have no choice, even though he's shooting essentially what 50% from three on the year. Yeah. And, but now they're starting to leave Fletcher lawyer open because I guess the numbers are telling them to give uh, telling teams to give him that shot. Well, go right ahead because, you know, Fletcher's had, you know, for throughout the year, you know, they're, he doesn't always get those open shots. Teams are, when he gets going, they really make sure they run him off the three-point line. But right now, they're giving him a lot of open shots, which that's why like people are like, oh, Fletcher's got, you know what? 
the more Fletcher gets those kind of looks a couple times, he stepped in and took a two point shot. He's going to find his rhythm here. Eventually you, you certainly see the struggle. Um, you know, we all acknowledge that, but if they're going to give him that open look, I'll take that. I'll take that most days, you know, and I know it's a balance between him and Ethan and Camden Heidi, and there's a little bit of offense defense trade off. And it seems like Camden is kind of the, the best of both worlds, you know, but Fletcher is an outstanding shooter. So I'll take those open shots all day long. Yep. Yeah, for sure. And like, we, we've got to get Fletcher going before the tournament. We're going to need him at some point in the tournament. And I will talk about individual player performances later on, but for as much chatter as I've seen about it, I thought today was kind of a step in the right direction for Fletcher in some ways um, in that regard. But you're, you're right about Braden, right? They're high hedge in that ball screen much, much more. Uh, what Braden's done a much better job of this year in my mind is dragging that out and waiting instead of trying to press. He used to like really try to press through that um, earlier on in his career and he's kind of just dragging and waiting. And then, you know, if he gets to the right time, like sometimes he can whip it to Zach rolling down the lane or he can whip it all the way across court. Uh, we've seen him make that like side to side pass all the way over to Jones or somebody like that for a three as well. So he's just got a much more comfortable and patient in his read on that. Uh, this year than he was last year. Yeah, and that's where, what, similar to the IU game, this is obviously a little bit better shooting. Brain doesn't shoot the ball well at all today, and he gets 11 points, but he has 11 assists to, compared to three turnovers. Um, one of the turnovers was probably the right read to Edie, just probably the poor execution with how he got the pass there. Um, I forget the other two off the top of my head, but 11 assists to three turnovers like against a team that, Mich yes, Michigan is a bad defense, and that is what it is, but Either way, they're still applying that pressure for 40 minutes against him. Having 11 assists to three turnovers is a big deal. So um, I do have to get going, and I'm uh, going to let you two uh, do this for the rest of the show. And, yeah, so I know we got some All stuff. Right, this fine. Week. Back fine. On. fine. If well, you got to go, you got to go. But, you know, SJF wanted to ask about the weave. But if you don't want to answer SJF. They'll all, they, Purdue it. always, not always, but Purdue will <laughs> always use utilize the weave within their offense 100%. Also, I know, uh, I think Michael Hogg said something about double screens, more double screens. 100% Purdue has been utilizing more of these double screens at the top of the key. Um, again, it's similar concept to that pick and roll I said, where it's just you have ED dive, you have Gillis pop, or you have the weak side corner, whether it be lawyer, whether it be Heidi Gillis, um, they'll also rotate back to the top. So give you a little bit more there on my way out. Yes, we appreciate it. A lot of people in the chat were excited for the return of X's and O's with Joe. And we'll have a lot more of that here as the season continues. I'm going to make him bring the dry erase yes. board next Saturday. And yes. if he doesn't bring it, uh, he's going to be in a lot of trouble. Yeah. He's going to be in a lot of trouble. So, all right, Joe, we'll cut you right. loose here. And, um, you know, we got some big shows here coming up this week. So stay tuned for those announcements. Uh, so until then, uh, we'll see you soon. Yep. See you guys. There's Joe Jackson taking off. Well, now, here. now we can really get into the in-depth analysis now that Joe's gone. Yeah. I mean, seriously, I, now we're really going to, now you're really going to, wow. we're going to break down the, <laughs> you're really going to break down the analytical game. This is where. I start to break down the minutes rotation, even though Joe's explained this graph to me that we've pulled up on the screen many times this season, and I still don't quite understand what I'm looking at. I just see a lot of colors, and it's very nice. Uh, so I will not be breaking down the rotation minutes here today. Uh, but at the same time, you know, uh, you know, we appreciate Joe's analysis. So he's taking the rest of the day. He's got some things to do, and uh, we love Joe. So uh, it was exciting for the return of X's and O's with Joe, but yeah, I mean, Craig, it, you're really just seeing the ammunition that Purdue has, you know, and Matt Painter is such a good counter puncher to what teams are throwing at you. He's got so many different plays and the way they run their system. There's so many different layers to how you have like two or three different options off each play. They try to run and, you know, in years past, you know, they, they didn't maybe have as many options uh, offensively with the kind of firepower they now have in Lance Jones. We talk about it a million times, the X factor that he is. And now you're just so worried about Braden Smith getting loose. And, you know, he's got eyes in the back of his head and Zach Eady is obviously a handful. And then you've got Mason Gillis who last year, 
you know, there were times where he struggled with the three. Now he's shooting 50% from three and that's your, that's your four, you know, and we talked about earlier this season, you know, trying to figure out how they were going to shake out the four and th they've figured it out. Now Trey Kaufman runs going to meet and potatoes it. Mason Gillis is your glue guy chasing down rebounds. And now he's starting to hit dagger threes. And that's that, you know, uh, Grady Eifert role, right? That helped catapult this team to an elite eight and almost into a final four. And uh, I think Grady was probably shooting close to 50% from three on very low volume, you know, but I know he, I know he was shooting a high clip uh, because that was just his bread and butter that year. And, and so if, if Mason can be that guy, man, it's, it's going to be really hard for teams to try to figure, figure out how to stop them because you essentially know what they're doing. But because they have so many options, it's kind of a pick your poison deal. All right. And Zach just draws so much attention. Um, and, and when he draws that much attention, when you have a point guard like Braden Smith, who's one of the best in the entire country, and knowing where everybody is on the court at all times, and, and he just has in his head what those actions are going to be. And you'll see him every once in a while. He'll get upset if a guy is two foot two feet away from where he was supposed to be in that action, because sometimes he'll whip it without really even knowing um for sure exactly where the guy is uh but that that roll and replace action right where where zach or tkr but mainly zach is going to roll down and then mason's just gonna fill that gap right he's gonna fill the empty space it's just so hard for teams to defend against because zach draws so much attention and then brain's gonna find people no matter where so if you try to help off and crash over uh, Braden's going to whip it all the way across the court to Lance Jones for a wide open three or lawyer in the corner, something like that. So it's just a really potent package and obviously not a ton of bench scoring tonight. Uh, Gillis scored and Heidi scored. So I think 10 points off the bench, but you know, you go back to the last game and Cam Heidi comes in and gives you 18. So there's, there's options there. And most nights they just need a little bit from Gillis because as long as Fletch is going, your five starters are all capable of putting up points on any given night. Yes, sir. So um, we'll move on to the next segment here where we start to highlight some of the individual performances as we start to you know, head towards third base. I know it's spring training for baseball. Matt Painter's a big Cub fan. The Cubs signed Cody Bellinger at about 2.30 in the morning last night, so I'm sure Matt was excited about that. Uh, so we'll move into the stats of the game. We, we were getting some feedback from some of our fans and you know that's why with team stats we're going to shake it up a little bit and 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 just focus on some of the 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 top stats of each game and, and maybe not run through everything word for word um you know we always try to you know be very detailed because you know people that really tune in i know enjoy the details to this show that certainly that uh joe and craig bring and then you just got to kind of deal with my rants uh so i appreciate you uh everyone tuning in, please hit that like button. If you haven't already and, and subscribe to the channel. Uh, we really appreciate you guys. If you hit the like button and you subscribe on, um, you know, our YouTube channel, it really helps the algorithm and sends it to fans that may not know of us yet. And, and we want to keep building this community as, uh, we head towards a final four. Uh, so we'll, we'll go over some of the players, you know, we talked about Zach Eady, obviously 35 points on 14 of 18 shooting. Talk about efficiency, seven of 11 from the free throw line uh, today. So, you know, he was perfect the last two games. So he had a, a few misses, 15 rebounds, 35 and 15 um, from Zach. So just an unbelievable performance in 38 minutes of play. But we can start to kick it around the horn. I know Braden Smith was just shy of a triple double, Craig. Um, you know, obviously we've talked about him a bunch today, but 11 points, eight rebounds, 11 assists in 39 minutes of action for Braden. Just, you know, just another outstanding performance in a lot of ways. Yeah. And one thing you kind of skipped over there on Zach that I thought was I, I, but 35 points and 15 rebounds is absolutely impressive. Amazing performance by him. Uh, like you said, season high. Uh, but with what we've seen in some of the recent games, I think just as important is the fact that he finishes tonight with zero turnovers. So um, did a much better job of taking care of the basketball. And like Painter says over and over again, with as well as his team offensive rebounds, if they can just get a shot up, uh, it's so, so important because there's so many times you're going to get a tip in or a putback uh, with this team and the way that they rebound. But yeah, you know, I 
I pointed it out partway through the second half. I thought this game, because it looked like a game that was going to stay in that 10 point range uh, all the way up to the finish, thought this might be the chance where Braden got his triple double. Uh, Cause a lot of those games where he's been really, really close painters pulled him out with seven or eight minutes to go, but obviously he didn't shoot the ball great tonight. One of five from three, three of 14 overall. Uh, but he just impacts the game in so many different ways, whether it's controlling the pace or the flow of the game, uh, just directing everything out there like he's a wizard on the court, whatever it is, you know, you just stat sheet suffer, right? Uh, 11 points, eight rebounds, 11 assists to only three turnovers, like Joe pointed out earlier. Um, those are ridiculous stat lines, even if the shooting itself wasn't that great. But, you know, for me, I he, Joe kind of said, well, maybe, you know, outside of Zach, maybe nobody played their A game. And, I, you know, yeah, Lance had a moment or two this game, like he always does. There's always one or two Lance moments. But I thought Lance was really dang good this game. Finishes with 15 points, 6 of 12 from the field. He shoots 43% from three, only has one turnover on the game, two assists, three rebounds. And I, in stretches, right, I look, Doug McDaniel, he's one of those guys that's going to get his points. Tyson Walker is going to get his points. Boo Boo is going to get his points. You try to slow him down. You try to contain him. Um, McDaniel got a couple of real early threes. And then I thought after that, Lance did a really nice job of just pumping the brakes and slowing him down a little bit, getting some body on him, being a little bit physical with him. But he's so dang quick, man. Like Doug has got to be one of the two or three fastest yep. people in the entire Big Ten right now. And just an absolute beast from an offensive standpoint. But I thought Lance was really, really good today. Yeah, there's no question. I mean, it wasn't a perfect day from him, but he just keeps coming at you. Um, he had that acrobatic layup at one point, the little reverse layup. Yeah. That was nasty. Um, uh, more than a few times he hit threes that were real daggers, momentum killers for Michigan. Um, you know, I see some people in the chat saying it wasn't his best defensive day. Uh, you know, I don't know if you want to speak on that, Craig, but I, I'm always just so impressed how Lance just does such a good job fighting through screens and not letting someone get around him. He just does a really good job of sliding his feet. We've, we've really been um, putting the full court press on Lance Jones to come on the show here and, and give us a quick interview. And that that's definitely something I would love to ask him about is his technique and mindset on how he fights through screens and keeps guys in front of him because he really cuts guys off and 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 changes the way a, an offense is coming at you they think they're going to do one thing lance completely cuts it off and they have to reverse it to the other side of the court a lot of times yeah and and a lot of what michigan did today was try to get a switch and then iso up uh, howard kind of with that nba mindset and they've got some shot makers on this team and they got to that mid-range but when he started to get going. I thought Lance did a really nice job uh, of just slowing him down and trying to disrupt the offense when when Doug was kind of getting in the lane and, and wheeling and dealing for the most part. And like you said, in terms of fighting through those screens, he draws two uh, offensive fouls on Michigan by yep. just going full out through that screen. And if that guy's not set, it's always going to get called on the defender. And he gets two of those called, and as we know, uh, foul trouble for Michigan was a big, big issue today. And he was part of the reason, like one of those, I forget who it was on, but one of those was on somebody that was, I think it was their fourth foul. Um, and if you're Michigan, the last thing you want your do want to do is want one of your bigs to pick up, um, a fourth foul on, on a screen that's not set. Well, right. I mean, he fouled out, um, who did he Jackson, right? He fouled out Jackson at the end of the game where he poked the ball loose oh, on the yeah, baseline. Yeah or not the baseline, the sideline. And then there's like a loose ball and, and Jackson tried to pull Lance Jones back. Cause Lance probably would have beat him to the basketball. And uh, that was where Juwan Howard almost got thrown out of the game uh, for coming on the court. It seemed like he was getting ready to go off on the ref. We've seen him do that a few times uh, against Matt Painter. And that's the other thing too. Like you were talking about, you know, Zach not having any turnovers. There was one where I think Zach could have been called for a turnover in the first or for a travel in the first half. They didn't call it. Then all of a sudden I'm seeing Michigan's bench and their fans calling for a travel like every single time, including yeah. on the final possession before halftime. Wasn't a travel, boys. And you, you know, now you turn into the boy who cried wolf if you're just gonna call for a travel every time. And 
you know, Juwan Howard and every other coach and every other fan base that goes up against Purdue, they know they're coming into the game and they want to mug Purdue and then get mad when fouls are called. Like you don't get to have your cake and eat it too. You're fouling all game. The fouls are going to add up and you coming on the court and shaking your head every single time a whistle's blown. Well, you know what? Play Purdue straight up and see how it goes for you. You know, that's all I'd say to it. Yeah. And for a lot of teams, all they can do, right, is is test that limit of how many fouls are they going to call. Um, and we saw that in the Tennessee game. Uh, we've seen that in a few other games this year. And I, I think Purdue's mindset this year is just way better to be able to withstand that. Uh, now we saw them still kind of catch them in one game this year, but they just seem to be able to absorb the physicality uh, and respond to the physicality much better this year than they did last year all the way around. So the yeah. other guy, Greg, like, I, I know there was still a lot of lawyer talk today, but at least we saw lawyer see a three go through, go down today. Right. Yes. <laughs> um, he, he ends, ends up one of five from three. He actually hit a three out of the corner and they called a foul down low. I know uh, we're counting, we're counting that here at boilers in the sands. Right. We're counting right. that one. Um, but you know, he, he hits a little 18 footer. He gets to the rim and hits a layup, um, had another layup, just barely rim out. So, yep. And it was I, a nice, and it was a nice take on that one too. Yeah. I, I thought Fletcher looked better today. It wasn't a great game from him. Um, but he looked like somewhere along the way, somebody has got in his head and said, keep shooting, keep shooting. And we need him to keep shooting. Uh, cause we need him back around in, in full force when it comes to March and, I a few games ago I was talking about some of the guys looking tired and part of that for me one of the bigger things for me was I thought Fletcher's mechanics uh, in his shot had had just looked flat his, to me the the ball was coming off really flat and almost line drive like on a lot of his shots and the last two games I I thought that form and, and just the natural arc of the ball has it looked much more like it did early in the season than it did kind of in this last seven or eight game stretch before that um, so I'm. I think he's about to turn the corner. We we get a week off or almost a week off. He gets to come home uh, playing against his brother's old team right. um, at home. And I, I just have this sneaking suspicion that Michigan State is going to be a get right game for lawyer. Yeah. And, you know, I yeah, I, I agree. I hope so for sure. Um, and I think it's only a matter of time before he breaks out. You've got other guys that are hot on this team. So it's good to have that in your back pocket. You know, I mean, there are times where everybody's hot and you're like, well, eventually this is going to come down to earth. So, you know, everybody seems to take a turn. He did have the one three at the top of the key that he didn't you like, even off his hand, it didn't look feel comfortable. That was his first one. That 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 was his very first one. I think. Was it? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, but at the end of the day, I liked when he stepped in and took the the mid range jumper, you know, a lot of times for shooters when they're struggling, sometimes taking a couple steps in and knocking one down or getting to the free throw line are things that can help you. Um, and so, yeah, I, I just think it's a matter of time. A, a guy like Fletcher lawyer, uh, his shooting, you know, pedigree, you know, it, it, to me, it speaks for itself. I know two years in a row, he's kind of hit a wall at the same time, but you know, I, to me, especially if they're going to leave them as open as they did today, I'll I'll take my chances with Fletcher knocking those down because once he sees a couple go in, now all of a sudden you might have a guy that drops 27 on you. Right, no doubt. And I, I know there's a lot of discussion about him versus Cam. Um, I really think the discussion more times is maybe him versus Morton if you really need that defensive presence if they're picking on lawyer defensively. Um, but right now Cam's just not – a super comfortable ball handler. So in in many of the rotations in terms of the way that it's going to work, that's not really the option, right? So if you have Lance and Braden both out there, you can have Cam in, you can have Morton in there at times because then you've got two ball handlers. But a lot of times they need Fletcher out there just from what he can do coming around that dribble handoff and coming off and, and, and getting into the lane whether he's actually going to shoot it or not, or just try to get Michigan, for example, out of rotation and then swing the ball again. It's not really something that's in Cam's game yet. Um, You saw him drive in once today, uh, stop and play off both feet and try to throw a nice, a little bounce pass to TKR. I think it was. Um, And, you know, it, it didn't turn out well. So um, Cam brings a lot of really good things to the table. 
uh, in terms of three point shooting, in terms of his length as a defender. And, but right now he's a straight line driver outside of that, from a ball handling standpoint, he's just not quite there yet. Yeah. And when you talk about Morton and trying to decide who, you know, who you're trying to balance against the three, he put up, you know, it was a tough yeah. one. He, he bricked that one pretty bad off the backboard. And I just, it's, 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 uh, I'm, I'm frustrated for him. Cause I know I'm sure he's um probably down on himself about it. You can see him questioning himself even when he has the open look and that time he ripped it and it went off the backboard and that's not going to help his confidence at all so I, I feel yeah. bad for him in a lot of ways because you're talking about a guy that was the player of the year you know coming out of high school in, in Pennsylvania and he's got ability and now he's become a defensive specialist here at Purdue and you know, I'm sure he had dreams of having a bigger role, but just like a lot of guys on this team, Caleb first and others, they always do such a good job of assimilating to the role that they're asked to do because there's a bigger goal in mind. But you just hope that Ethan can find some semblance of confidence on the offensive side, even if that's not exactly what they're asking him to do. Yeah, no doubt. Um, I, I think at this point, just where he's at in his career, Ethan probably is what Ethan is. I don't know that we're going to see any massive changes in the last six or seven games of, of, of this season, you know? So I think really similar to, I mean, Ray fell was a better scorer than Ethan. Um, but Ray fell came in out of high school as an elite scorer, and people looked at him like he was going to come to college and be that guy. And sometimes you just find out at the next level when, when everybody's as athletic as you and physical as you, that you're not that guy. Um, and very similarly, you know, Ray fell had to turn himself into a defensive specialist. Now he had a couple of games, a Michigan state game where he blows up for a decent amount of points, but primarily that was his role. Um, and there's going to be a game in March where Ethan's defense is going to win the game for us in some ways. And he still has a really important role to this team. I just don't know that it's going to be offensive. I mean, if you run it back to when Purdue beat Texas in Milwaukee for the right to go to the sweet 16, a few years ago, I can remember Ethan Morton having some big minutes in that game, you know, and, and being a part of the reason why they shut down. Um, who was the point guard from Minnesota that transferred to Texas? Um, uh, car car. And, and he was doing a good job on him for portions of that game. So yeah, that's his role, and eventually his number is going to get called on. Bitcoin is freedom in the chat. He he brought this up earlier in the show. He wanted to ask Joe, and I did highlight it, Bitcoin, but Joe had to take off, and he was wanting to know about the plus minus with this lineup of Braden, Lance, Heidi, Gillis, and Edie, and he, he believes that this should be the go-to lineup, and he thought, you know, those six minutes that they went to this lineup were the essential minutes uh, that turned the tide and he thinks, you know, without this lineup, they may not win this game here today. Do you have any thoughts on it? I, I mean, Braden Lance Gillis and Edie was really the answer in those six minutes, right? Cam cut to the basket, had, had a really nice cut, got in there for a layup, but yep. there wasn't necessarily a whole lot that, that Cam was doing more than Fletcher, for, even defensively, particularly in this game. Um, Cause he, Kind of got posted up a couple times today also. So I think those other four, um, you know, obviously we know Gillis brings a little bit more offensive firepower in terms of being able to hit a three compared to TKR and open things up just for everybody else on the court. Um, but like, that's not new, right? We know that we know there's certain matchups where TKR can dominate the four down low and post up. They tried it a couple times today and it just didn't work today, but we've seen other games where he went off for, you know, 10 to 16 points or whatever it might be. So I don't, you know, when, when Fletcher's playing good and like when he went for 27 against Alabama or Tennessee, like that's the most potent lineup when cam's playing good and hitting shots. Um, that's the most potent lineup probably. So it, it's a game to game thing. And there's absolutely no reason for us to try to pigeonhole it and say, it's gotta be exactly this way because we've seen over and over again this year that if somebody's got a hot hand, even when it was miles at times uh, earlier this season, if, he's not going to look at how many minutes they have been playing and be worried about it. Cam got yeah. a ton of run the other night because he was hot. Um, if Cam would have came in and been hot today, he'd have got a ton of run today too. 
Yep. Um, and, and Bitcoin just adding on to his points. You know, he says, you know, start watching lawyer on defense and, 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 and he says, people, people don't watch defense. And, and this is where I will agree with you to an extent. Bitcoin. Like when I talk, when I go on post game shows, I want to talk about the offense. I want to talk about the scoring and the pivotal moments where the ball went in the hoop. There's times where I'll highlight, you know, you know, hustling to the basketball and, and fighting for rebounds or, or shutting a guy down and, and sometimes, but yes, a lot of times, even on our show, we spend more time talking about the offense than we do the defense. I think everybody knows that there's a lot to be desired, you know, when it comes to a guy like lawyer on defense, we all see it. Um, you know, but then there's the balance of what he brings on the offensive side of the ball, how he can pull defenders off other players because he is a threat to shoot. So there's that balance. And, and we talk about that balance on every post game show of, you know, who to play, you know, who, what, and it's always match up, you know, uh, intensive and Craig points that out time and again, it's, it's a game to game basis of what they need in that moment. Sometimes you need a little more offensive threat. Maybe it's not even offensive scoring, but just the threat of offense with each of your guys. And then other times you need some more defense. And I think Matt Painter acknowledges that as well, but I, I'm not, I won't fight you on it. Bitcoin. I, we definitely, I definitely spend more time talking about the offense than I do the defense in most games. Or, or if you were just hanging out with me watching a game, uh, I think that is kind of the go-to for most fans in the stand. Yeah. I like, nobody's going to get on here and defend lawyers defense. Although um, the last game um, I actually, Joe and I talked about, he actually was one of his better defensive performances. Um, but yeah, like teams will try to hunt lawyer out at times um, and, and then go at him one-on-one. -on -one. And there was some times where that happened tonight. Um, this was not a game where it stood out as just being glaring and something that was so dramatic that it looked like, Oh my God, you can't have him out there. Cause like I said, when cam came in, he got posted up a couple times by Michigan's got some long wings. Um, and they kind of drove him down and posted him up and hit a couple shots over cam too. So I, I don't know that there was a big swing in this particular game one way or another. Right. So, you know, okay. Well, I don't know who else we have that you really want to highlight here in the team stats or player stats as we're, you know, starting to head around third and head home on this show, you know, um, you know, Lance Jones, 15 points. We talked about him, Braden Smith. We talked about him, just talked about Fletcher, uh, Trey Kaufman ran. I don't know how much you want to touch on him. It seems like he's been struggling as of late, only four points on the day, you know, eight rebounds. Yeah, but some not of that's opportunity. Three rebounds. Some, I apologize. Some of that's opportunity, right? I mean, he only had four shots. So uh, it, it's not like, I mean, he played an efficient game. The the four shots he took, he hit two out of those four. Um, and I thought there were a couple of moments in this game where he played really good defense. He caused a turnover on one of those drives. Um, he's gotten a lot better in terms of his lateral speed uh, all, the, all throughout this year. And I think you're starting to see his ability to guard fours. And if he gets switched, um, he's been guarding guards in space fairly decent for a guy that's built the way he is and at his size. So I, I thought he brought good energy. I thought him and Gillis both, I always look at that as a combo package in terms of what we're getting out at the four, because they're going to play 40 minutes combined, right? Between the two of them. And it may lean more one way or the other on any specific night. But I look at that combination I thought the four spot was really good for us, even though I think it only led to maybe 12 points overall in this game. Um, but good energy. I thought they both rebounded pretty well. I thought they both played relatively decent defense. Well, and I think the other thing that a lot of fans are looking at is the lack of Miles Colvin. Derek Mulliken in the chat says, imagine being Colvin on the bench, watching Lawyer and Morton combine for 40 minutes a game and combine for six points, two rebounds, and three assists. Uh, your thoughts, Craig? I'm tired of talking about it. I really am. I'm just sick and tired of talking about it. Like miles has gotten some run in the last five games or so. Um, there's been multiple times where painter has brought him in for four or five minutes at the end of the first half to see if he could bring a little bit of a spark plug. He's going to give him some opportunity. Um, if he does some work out there, if he can stay in his defensive assignment, his defensive role and knock down some shots, he's going to get run. Uh, I don't think it's a matter in any way, shape or form. Uh, that Painter hasn't tried to give him a little bit of opportunity to see where it's going. But at the same time, this is the number three team in the country. They're 25 and freaking three on the season. 
And there's 10 guys on this team that are capable of playing. And all of those guys have different characteristics that fit this team for a specific skill set and use that they do at an extremely high level. This is one of the best offensive teams in the country ranked. I don't know exactly what they're ranked in offensive efficiency right at this moment, but they've been in the top five almost all year long. The main thing that Miles brings to this team is offensive output. Okay, So if Purdue's already excelling at that high of a level offensively, a lot of times what you're going to look at providing outside of that from your role players is going to be added defensive um, acumen out there on the court. So right now, I don't think that's necessarily one of his strong traits at this point in time in his career. Yeah. I mean, well said, uh, well said, you said you were tired of talking about it, but then you were spitting hot fire right there, Craig. So, uh, and that's why, that's why we, and I like, look, I love miles. Miles is going to go to the NBA. Miles is going to likely in my mind, I think there's a really good chance that miles starts next year because of the difference in the way this team is going to be and what they need from those wings next year without Zach compared to what they need to fit around Zach in this specific year. If he doesn't start, he's going to get starter minutes next year. Um, similar to like a Gillis role, getting those type of minutes. He's going to be extremely, extremely good. Uh, but it's about time and place and what this specific team needs around its two-star players and Smith and Edie right now. Yeah, hey, man, you were preaching there. It's Sunday, so I, you just took everybody to church. Uh, David Dillman in the chat says um, they're second in Kempom, um, you know, for uh, offensive yeah. efficiency. So – you know, pretty damn good. I think, um, you know, there's, you know, like we're, we're always going to be picking nits on perfection and looking for, you know, the road map to Arizona. Uh, somebody on Facebook says here, here, Craig, preach it brother. So we appreciate you, Craig, given your insight to, uh, the team. So Craig, do you got anything else you wanted to highlight as far as in terms of spotlighting any of the players that we want to move on? No, let's move on. Okay, we'll move on then. Uh, we appreciate everybody hanging out. Please, once again, hit that like button if you have it while you're still hanging out here. We're over an hour and 10 minutes on this show. And if you're still hanging out, that means you enjoy what you're seeing. If you hit the like button on YouTube, subscribe to the channel. Uh, that certainly helps us out in a big, big way. And then also, you know, you can hit up our Teespring store and get your boilers in the stands gear. Uh, we're going to be adding some more stuff to the store, some uh, zip ups and and collared shirts. We already got hoodies and and stickers and and t shirts on there of all different sizes and color options. Uh, so you can get your boilers in the stands logo and uh, wear it proudly when you go to Mac here. If you're going to be headed to the tournament, we'd love to see you guys in that gear. So please uh, hit up the Teespring store, uh, search Brags in the stands, or if you're watching here on uh the youtube channel you can see the the dot com teespring.com slash stores slash brags in the stands so uh yeah let's kick it around here we're 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 like i said we're starting around you know and and finish this up you know like i said michigan state here coming up next saturday you know illinois who's chasing us purdue is two games up in the win column with three games to go Michigan State coming up on Sunday. Illinois will play two more games before uh, Purdue plays another basketball game. So Illinois has got Minnesota at home, and then they've got Wisconsin on the road. And uh, Purdue, one way or another, has a chance to either have a clinch of the uh, share of the Big Ten title or win the complete thing outright on Saturday, um, Saturday evening at Mackey Arena. So that's pretty exciting. Yeah, no doubt. And having that magic number down to one in terms of uh, being able to at least share um, a piece of the Big Ten title uh, is awesome uh, with three games to go yet. So that Michigan State environment is always a lot of fun. Um, will they, if it's a share of the title, will they go ahead and like do the celebration then or do they wait until they know if it's outright? I forget. I, I doubt they would on a share. Um okay. I, I doubt they would because then you still have the last home game against Wisconsin. I'm still like very, I know this is like a thing, like who cares, but I am interested just to see overall how they celebrated. I mean, last year they had the confetti and, you know, they did the trophy ceremony and Gene Katie was on the floor and 
they really took it in and enjoyed it as they should. And if they want to do that again this year, uh, I fully embrace that. And we'll provide some, we had some great pictures and video content from that celebration last year. So if they do that, we'll be back giving you guys some more of that content, but I am curious to see how they go about it this year. And, and um, you know, it'll be interesting is, is is something I've, I've kept going back to. So you're right though. Um, you know, if Illinois loses one more time before Purdue plays, they've already clinched a share and then maybe they could take care of their business on their own. I mean, if Illinois loses their next two games, then Purdue has won it outright before they even play on Saturday. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, that's the other I, aspect of this. I, I mean, I, they're going to have a celebration, right? Um, there, there's always three goals to every single Purdue season, um, to win the, the big 10, regular season when the big 10 turning and then try to win a national championship. So, um, hitting number 26, whether they get a, a piece of that or whether they get it outright, I'm sure there's going to be a celebration in Mackey at some point in time, uh, would be great. Would be awesome if Illinois lost one so that that game against Michigan state was for the outright, because then that celebration could happen and, and be super special as those guys play, you know, one of their last two games in, in Mackey before their season. And, well, for a lot of those guys before their career wraps up. So, you know, that and that's something I'm not going to preach again, but that's something I, I would just say to Purdue fans. Right. We have three games left. Two of those are at home. Um, chances are 99 percent sure that this is going to be your your last two times to enjoy Zach Eady, to enjoy Mason Gillis, to enjoy Ethan Morton. Um, so by all means, take it in. Enjoy it. Uh, just enjoy that experience before we get another run heading into March and see what can happen. And hopefully uh, that picture looks a lot different than it did last year, but there's only going to be so many times unless hopefully you all travel. Uh, but we know that gets harder when it comes to tournament time. So for those of you guys that mainly can just get to the home games, enjoy it, man. Yeah. I mean, and when you talk about the golden era of Purdue basketball, they said it on the telecast. Um, they tied today, I think with 84 or 83 wins over the last three years, which is tied for the most wins in a three year span in the history of the men's basketball program at Purdue. So that that's significant that, and they have three games to go. So uh, just in the regular season, I'm sure those wins also count beyond the regular season. So you're talking about, go ahead, Greg. I, I, I was yawning. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know if, I didn't know if they did count it after the regular season or not, but regardless, they're likely to clinch the, most wins ever in a three-year span in the history of their program. They just tied it today. And so to your point about appreciating this, this has never been seen before. Um, and Zach Eady, you know, is the reason that, you know, you've got hundreds of fans waiting after every game at Mackey Arena. There's all these upgrades around the 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 building and and you know some of the amenities underneath the stadium for the players. You know, it's it's becoming the house that Zach Eady built in a lot of ways, and Matt Painter too. And so, once again, you also have a chance to go to these games if you don't have tickets. Like we said earlier, if you if you weren't tuned in, you know, Autograph is a is a new partner of ours, and they're dropping two ticket packages for the Michigan State game at Purdue on uh, February twenty eighth at twelve p.m. Pacific time in the Autograph app. Each package is um, you know a chance for you. Here, I got to make sure I get this right for everybody to understand. But, you know, each package includes two tickets in section 102, row nine. And then Autograph is dropping three ticket packages for the Wisconsin at Purdue game, the final home game of the season. And that'll be on March 6th at 12 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, each package is $32 a piece uh, for both things. So you get a chance to get these tickets at face value. Anybody that knows when buying tickets, to go to Mackey Arena can be a lot more expensive than that. Um, and so if you use the QR code that you see here on the screen, you download the Autograph app on your phone. It's only available on iPhone right now in a week or so. It should be available here on Android as well. And you can, you know, th the more points you get by joining and uh, being, you know, um, you know, somebody that, you know, is a user friendly member of the autograph app, you get more points to your score. And if you're a top scorer, you'll have a chance to win some tickets 
uh, autograph is taking care of the fans and they're going to be sending fans to the final four as well. So just wanted to give our new partners one more quick shout out as we yeah. get to the game ball segment of our show. So J Craig, who are you giving the game ball to? I mean, this is a little bit too easy today, right? It, it's, it's just, it's gotta be Zach Eady and it can't be anybody, anybody else. And like I said, Braden uh, played a good all-around game, not a great shooting game. Lance, I thought, was really solid today. Uh, but if you put up 35 points, 15 rebounds, two assists, and zero turnovers, that's it. That answers it. End of discussion. Zach Eady gets your game ball today. And um, not particularly close, even though a lot of people contributed and played well today. Yeah, 100%. And so since you went with the easy one, I'll, then I'll take the second easiest one, and I'm going to take Braden Smith. I mean, both these guys – are just the gravity that they, you know, create. And, you know, it's defenders are just flowing their way at all times. It opens up wide open shots for Mason Gillis, Fletcher Lawyer, Lance Jones. It opens up, you know, uh, open cutters to the basket. Braden Smith with eyes in the back of his head, a nice pass to Camden Heidi, cutting to the rim, you know, nice inlet passes to Zach Eady. He's always navigating. He's pushing the tempo the last couple games. Um, you know, and, and not letting the offense get stagnant off rebounds, they're going and they're pushing the pace and it's getting them to the free throw line. It's, it's getting them some easier buckets than just having to set it up in the system that they have. So, you know, those are some easy ones, but that's why they get the game ball. Zach Eady and Braden Smith with the game balls for the game. Um, you know, I did see a bunch of people saying, you know, like we said with the, the autograph app, a bunch of people, you know, Rowlett Boiler just signed up, Blake Widmer, SLK Boiler, uh, a lot of different people signed up. Blake Widmer wanted some clarification. Is the QR code the same thing as the bits code? Because that's a good point to make. No, the QR code downloads the app. And then when you download the app, you have to use a code to enter into the app. And so when you do, it's going to ask you for a code. That's the only way you can use the app. You're going to use the code BITS uh, once you use that QR code. So once again, I'll flash it on the screen for you. Download the app off this QR code. Once you go in and download the app, it's going to ask you for a code. Use the promo code BITS, and that's how they know that you heard it from us here at Boilers in the Stand. So appreciate you asking for that clarification. Um, so I think that about wraps things up here, Craig, unless you've got anything else that you wanted to touch on before we call it a day. Not really a lot. Uh, I think we've covered everything pretty well. Um, I've already got up on my soapbox a couple of times today, so like no, need for, no, no need for me to expound much uh, further than that. It's all Big Ten road games are good wins, man. Um, and the interesting thing about the last two Big Ten road games is it's two teams that have, are vastly underperforming. Uh, when you looked at the talent of Michigan, they were supposed to be a middle of the tack, middle of the pack program this year in the Big Ten, and it's not they them not being there is not because they don't have the talent. Um, so those games are always a little scary because you never know when they're going to put it together. And obviously, they don't have Doug on the road. He would be a top 10 guard in the Big Ten easily if he played every single game uh, in the Big Ten season. Ohio State, very similar, right? A team that jumped up and got us. Uh, a team that should have, based upon you know predictions at the beginning of the season and the talent they have, been a top five team in the Big Ten. Um, they haven't performed to that level, uh, but those teams always can pop up, so it scares you. Uh, so it's nice to see Purdue go out and just keep Michigan at arm's length uh, the entire second half and just kind of – as Joe said, a little bit, just kind of coasted out to the win. Yeah, hundred percent. So I'm going to run through some of these chats that I've highlighted here to end the show. Uh, Brad Prather uh, saying witnessing history, every game with Edie, what hasn't been said about how great his entire story and career, what hasn't been said about how great his entire story and career has been just trying to soak it all in. You absolutely should Brad. It's a special time. Uh, for boiler maker nation. Um, Logan says, okay, fine bits. There you go, Logan. That's the spirit. Blake Widmer just signed up. That was easy. We appreciate your guys' support. Dead Hoosier in the chat saying, if you hit the like button, lawyer will go five of six behind the arc next game. Test it and see. Uh, it's, it, it's science. It's, it's a guarantee. If you hit the like button, Fletcher lawyer, five of six here. Uh, on Saturday night 
uh, six days from now. So a nice little layover for Purdue to rest up and lawyer to rest up. Uh, Chad P says in the chat, us knuckleheads telling a 25 and three four time big 10 coach of the year, how to coach his team. LOL. Well, Hey, we're all experts and that's why we all have podcasts to talk about just how smart we are. Uh, Blaine J in the chat said, if time, can we have a two minute discussion on big 10 coach of the year? Now, this was something that really pissed me off last year when they gave Big Ten Coach of the Year to Chris Collins, who did a great job with Northwestern, but I took real offense to them not giving it to Matt Painter last year. Um, and if they try to not give it to Matt Painter this year, I'm going to take this computer in front of me and break it, Craig. That's my he, thoughts. He, he's not going to get it this year. What the? Why? Uh, cause it's probably going to be Ben Johnson at Minnesota or Fred Hoiberg in Nebraska. I, I, it, it frustrates me as well. The, the primary, it doesn't frustrate me as much with like the Ben Johnson story, but some of these coaches that, um, are, are getting talked about for national coach of the year, you know, it's like, well, like they weren't expected to do quite as much this year. And, Look at how he's made these pieces of three or four guys that they brought in and transfer from the transfer portal fit to make this team as good as they are. So essentially what that argument is saying is, okay, so if we go out and poach talent that is already developed so that as a coach, I can see who they are and what they are when they kind of hit getting closer to their peak performance and I can bring them in and make them fit, that that's somehow being rewarded at a higher level than if I recruited that kid out of high school and actually developed his skills as a coach all the way through that. When we look at Zach Eady, when we look at like even where Braden Smith was ranked, where, where Zach Eady was ranked, um, the fact that Purdue has actually developed those guys, you know, in their time here, I think should mean something too. All right. Like that's got to mean something just as much as it means to be able to identify talent and go get it from the transfer portal. And quite frankly, it should mean more. Um, but everybody's going to look at it and say, well, he only had one new piece this year. So everybody knew what he had and he only had to do so much. Everybody was just naturally going to get a little better. Yeah, it's just frustrating because like last year where I took offense to it, I get the whole understanding of it. But like last year. You know, Purdue did struggle down the stretch, but at the same time, they were unranked to start last year. You right. know, I and I know this is a rant from last year's shows, but it's the truth. They they were unranked. They were the fastest team to go unranked to number one in the country. They had two freshmen in their starting lineup. You know, they turned Zach Eady into a national player in the year, who was a guy that was ranked in the 300s or 400s as a recruit coming to Purdue University. And it's just it, like they owe him. For last year, I understand Northwestern was a great story, but what they did at Purdue, it was like by the time January and February, everybody was like, well, yeah, this is what they're supposed to be. No, they were unranked to start the year, you know, and, and I think people lost sight of that all of a sudden. Now this year, yeah, they went into the season top five ranked and they've stayed in the top five all season, been ranked number one a few times. And, you know, but at the same time, like you know, reward greatness. What we're seeing here at Purdue has been greatness over the last three years. And Matt Painter should be rewarded for that. It, it's like all of a sudden it gets watered down, you know, like sometimes with players. I mean, Kobe Bryant only won one MVP his whole career. You know, there was a time where Michael Jordan didn't win an MVP over Carl Malone. Like, come on, you know, like it, it, at times I just think you overthink it. I'm not comparing you know, Matt Painter to Michael Jordan, but at the same time, like reward greatness. It shouldn't get watered down. You shouldn't get fatigue from the greats, you know, or, or who's doing the best and Purdue's on the brink of winning their 26th big 10 championship, the most in the conference, um, really starting to separate themselves from IU who is second. It was uh, much closer here, not too long ago. So, you know, it is what it is. I know Matt Painter is not worried about it, but um, something that frustrates me. So, yeah, Blake Widmer in the chat says, Zach's drop step and attacking the rim is the move I want to see a lot more of when he is posted on the block. I really enjoy watching Zach when he does execute that drop step, when he understands his the leverage he's getting from the defender and he drops that foot and uses his kind of body to turn towards the basket. And, you know, not a lot of uh, big men, 
are comfortable doing that. He wasn't early in his career. And now, you know, when it's there for him, he goes right to it. You can almost tell, you almost know, you know, just from seeing how teams defend him when it's coming. And th- today he got a look at it and went right to it. And he got an and one off it. It was a really nice play. Yeah, it's a thing of beauty when it's there. Um, it, it's all just about him reading what, how the guy is playing him and what's the right move to go to. And obviously he got that today. He's also developed that little like catch and kind of the the, the runner uh, move. That uh, That's the one that everybody wants to call a travel on because he covers like eight feet on those two steps um, as he's going to the rim. So uh, lots of different moves around the basket. Certainly love to see it. Yeah, hundred um, percent. So we got Edie Big Ten Player of the Week coming up. Um, um, sixty points and twenty two rebounds. I'd say he's Big Ten Player of the Week. Just go ahead and mail it to him. <laughs> go ahead and mail it to him. Um, then we got uh, Derek Mulliken in the chat. Always appreciate Derek hanging out with us. Anyone think Gillis could be a good three rather than a four, Craig? Uh, in the NBA, if he continues to develop his ball handling or in some professional league, probably not the NBA, uh, probably. I don't think in in this stage of his career, um, th- this year might have been the closest to being able to do that. But uh, I don't I don't think in, in that three spot, I don't know if he's got enough quickness from a defensive standpoint to guard. Uh, the other team's three in terms of how the college game is most usually played at this point in time. And I think just as importantly, you want your three guard. If you look at whether you call Jones or lawyer, the three or the two, whatever, um, or previous years, whoever the three was, um, was a pretty solid ball handler that you could count on from that standpoint. And Mason just doesn't put the ball on the floor all that much. Now we've seen, especially in the last two or three weeks here, um, that he's done that little head fake because they're respecting the three so much. And he's driving into the paint and shooting a little eight footer or something like that. Um, but in that three spot in painter system, like you're coming off, you're running all the way around the court, coming off of a curl, coming off of a screen, um, and then taking the ball, moving at full speed and, and dribbling there into the paint a lot of times. And I just don't think that's necessarily in Mason's game. All right. So we're moving on. Um, my mom's in the chat saying, uh, no, do not break the computer. Um, we'll see. We'll see, mom. You know, I have a temper. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, yeah, Craig's bracing me for it though. So I guess he won't get national player of the year. Who's Johnny in the chat saying this is your national coach of the year, whatever national coach. of the year. He didn't painter. Definitely. Is he getting national player of the year? Well, he's, he, you know, he's a baller. Uh, who's Johnny in the chat saying this is the year to get Katie a championship. He deserves it. Well said, Johnny, who said that he was an all state player in high school in the chat earlier. Um, So we appreciate him hanging out. Uh, Catherine says, or or before I get to Catherine, Bitcoin had the funniest chat of the day. He had a typo where he said sexy at like 2,198 ish points. And then he immediately auto corrected it and said, Edie, and then I think people in the chat determined that that we should just stick with sexy. And that, yeah, I, I don't know what Bitcoin's autocorrect is going to. I mean, you know, sometimes yeah. on autocorrect, it's going to change to words you use a lot, you know, in your typing Bitcoin. So ED, sexy, I don't know what happened there, but sounds like we've we've got a new nickname for Zach ED. Sexy ED. What do you say, Craig? Uh, maybe big, sexy, the big, sexy. Who was that? Shaq was Shaq big, uh, sexy. I think so. I think so. Shaq was big, sexy, you know, um, a lot of comparisons to Shaq, uh, as far as Edie's collegiate career. Uh, yeah, so but, they- but the important thing about that, that you brought up had nothing to do with the Edie sexy talk. It was the fact that Zach Edie is now second on the all time scoring list and 126 <laughs> points away, 126 points away from catching Rick Mount, which Three games left in the regular season, at least one guaranteed in both uh, the NCAA tournament and the Big Ten tournament. He should do that even if we don't get any extra games. If we do get extra games beyond that, uh, he should do it easily. Sure. It'll be exciting to see. He's got the most rebounds in uh, Purdue history, Purdue's uh, men's basketball program history, and 
He's going for the most points ever in the history of the program. Just a special player. So that wraps things up. Catherine here in the chat saying, thanks guys for an entertaining drive home this afternoon. Boiler up. We appreciate you tuning in. She tuned in from Twitter. Uh, so Catherine, if you want to jump over to our YouTube channel and hit that like button and subscribe when you get a chance, we always appreciate you and everybody else tuning in from Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. Uh, Derek Mulliken in the chat saying good win, good season. Enjoy these last three games. Enjoy the next month and a half. Let's go. Uh, we are definitely excited for it. Who's Johnny saying boiler up and we're going to have some more, um, shows here coming up this week. We've got some interviews planned, so stay tuned for those announcements. Uh, I know a lot of different people have been asking how they can help contribute here to the show and, and support what we're trying to do here. We're going to have some announcements on those as well. Uh, so honestly, everybody's showing up, you know, all this whole show hour and a half long. We still got, you know, close to 200 people tuning in live across three different platforms. That means a lot to us. Uh, we started small here, me and Craig a few years ago, and uh, we grew into, you know, bringing in Joe and Aiden and and what this has turned into has been a lot of fun and covering the best team in the country the last few years has been a lot of fun. And, and now we just hope that they can finish the job and get to a Arizona and we can have uh, some really special shows here coming up over the next month and a half. So um, we really appreciate you guys. This has just been so much fun building this community up. Uh, and this is officially the Midwestern goodbye where I tell everybody how much I love them. Uh, so, you know, I do, we, we do, we love you guys very much and we appreciate the community we're building here. Maybe we'll have a meetup. I don't know if it'll be Saturday for the, for the Michigan state game. Maybe we can try to coordinate a meetup. Um, we'll see. We'll talk about that behind the scenes, or maybe we'll try to plan it out for the final home game against Wisconsin. If that makes more sense. Um, we'll see, stay tuned for those kind of announcements. We did a meetup last year. That was a lot of fun. Uh, so we shall see. And then Jeff parks. Cause I just brought up Aiden said, did you see the brawl in that incarnate word game? I saw Aiden in the video. Anybody that hasn't seen it, Aiden, who was one of our co-hosts here last year, who's gone on to uh, an assistant coaching job, you know, with, with incarnate word, they did, they had this huge brawl that broke out and it made national news. And if you watch the video, if you go back and watch this video, Aiden is scrambling all over the place. He's not getting in the thick of the fight. You know, I, I don't know, like he was kind of around the perimeter trying to keep people out of it, be the peacemaker. So he wasn't throwing any blows. Aiden wouldn't do that, but uh, it was not a good scene, obviously watching players no. throwing blows, but it was entertaining watching uh, Aiden try to navigate through the whole thing. Yeah, uh, he did a nice job of trying to grab people and pull them back. It was great watching that video because he's got that like bright blonde hair like yes. almost whitish hair so it was yeah. so easy to follow him like you just yes. had to follow the bouncing blonde hair around the video. yeah no it was an ugly scene obviously you don't you don't have uh, slk boy where do we see this bro you just got to find it on like twitter or you can probably youtube it or google it uh just search you know incarnate word fight and i'm sure it's going to be the first thing that uh comes up so uh, Midwestern goodbye with a little shout out to Aiden, who we appreciate always. Uh, David Jenkins says beats an Irish goodbye. Hey, I'm Irish. So chill out there, but yes, the Midwestern goodbye. So, uh, that wraps things. What, what, what did I say? Did I say something stupid? I mean, it's getting late. You're Irish. I am Irish. I am Irish what? brags. Originality of uh, the origin of our name was Bra Brag brag b-r-a-g-g -G, okay. and then we added the s when it came over to america maybe i'm just making that up my mom can confirm or deny that in the chat but uh two hours later the midwestern goodbye we're all <laughs> yeah. still here yeah let's uh, let's finish this <laughs> yeah so yeah again stay tuned for announcements on some some guests coming up this week uh and of course we'll see you next saturday for the next post game show but make sure you tune in uh to the to the interviews we've got planned for this week as well so with that being said uh we've done everything else nice boilers win on the day um so we shall see you here soon hit that like button on your way out and always boiler up